In the myth of Hippolytus, the goddess Diana is presented as an androgynous chase goddess, a huntress whose values are set in opposition to the more overtly feminine and sensual ones of Aphrodite. Hippolytus is not the only myth which emphasises Diana's role as a hunter, a virgin and a punisher. But yet hidden in the remains of the Temple of Diana, we catch glimpses of an altogether softer side of the goddess's persona. Professor Katerina Lorenz expands on one particular object, a terracotta statue of a woman. It's a statue of a woman standing with one of her legs moving and she's dressed in kind of fairly, fairly thick garment. What makes her really interesting is, is that we can actually see some of her intestines because her abdomen is opened up and we, we, we can see her colon and her kidneys and her liver. So very un unusual in that. We have lots of female terracottas from the sanctuary, but this is the only one where we can actually see inside, as it were. It's interesting that despite Diana's rather formidable portrayal in myth, this model seems to suggest that her followers at the temple may have turned to her for nurturing at times of crisis in their lives. Basically, we call it a votive, which means that it is an object which someone dedicates to God in order to wish for something or to thank for something. In this particular case, obviously, there's a, there's a clear, clear emphasis being made on, on the interior organs. So we can deduce from that that this was probably dedicated by someone who had a problem with their, their inner organs. And this ties in very nicely with a whole range of other um, votive offerings we have from Nemi. They are not just confined to, to females st or statues of females or even organs of females like rooms, for instance. We have a couple of rooms from Nemi. Um, but we also find things like eyes, hands, limbs, arms, legs, feet, ears. So pretty much Every body part is, is represented as a votive offering in Nemi, um, and these were probably also deposited by people who either wanted to wish for better health or who already had received healing and wanted to, to thank the goddess because they were in the, in the belief that the goddess had kind of improved their health, helped them on the way to, to, to become healthy again. This may be an early example of a tradition that still continues in southern Italy to this day. In small rural churches, you can still find models of limbs or hands or organs donated as votives, and they have a link with health concerns. Now, the general idea is with these terracotta objects that they were probably produced close to the site so that they didn't have to travel very far and that people had stalled in the sanctuary, outside the sanctuary, for customers as aware to buy it and take it into the sanctuary. Very, very kind of simple, straightforward um, approach. You buy something, you put it there, you put a wish with it, you do the rites and then you go away again. It is interesting that for Diana's followers at the sanctuary, it was evident she was regarded as someone who women in particular would turn to for healing. Diana has kind of a second identity uh, that, that she is associated with precisely these parts of especially female life, things like procreation. So this is, makes her the goddess to, to whom people would turn in order to, and especially women would turn in order to um, wish for these things. And also she has a very interesting position um, with a view to the underworld in, in Greek and Roman thinking. She normally carries two torches, and we have some, some pieces from, from Nemi as well, for she's represented with torches. And the issue of light and, and the, the, the kind of torches indicate that she's, she's a figure who, who crosses the boundary between the real world and the underworld. So she's kind of a, a transitional goddess in all sorts of ways. And this is obviously also something which plays a role then when you think about the, 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 the situations people are in when they kind of wish for their health. They, they turn to Diana because she's the, the person who can turn, turn around fate and she can bring people back, as it were, from the underworld. And, and this makes her a particular powerful goddess to, to turn to. And what can we learn about the person who donated this object? We can probably speculate that it might have been given by or on behalf of a woman. And there are other things we can glean from its workmanship. In this particular case, again, coming from the archaeological um, evidence, we can probably say, OK, the object as such is not such an expensive object, um, fairly cheaply to produce. What is quite interesting is that actually the intestines, they are not made from a mould, but they are, they are kind of hand moulded and, uh, and put in there. So it's kind of a, a customised piece, as it were. So the person who did this, A, had probably a very big interest in, in, in dedicating it, 
but also might have been someone with slightly more money to spend on such an item. So in the minds of Diana's worshippers, the portrayal of the goddess's character they'd absorb from myth would have been subtly interwoven with various other influences and local traditions. In the next section, we'll follow more clues about the lives of the people who worshipped at the temple. 